Welcome to the South Bay Midweek Prayer and Bible Study. I know you're going to enjoy today's presentation. The live session is even better because we pray together at the beginning. Feel free to join us Tuesdays at 6.30 p.m. You can find the link on our website. Now sit back and enjoy some spiritual refreshment. So these are just kind of my, uh, some of the key points that I'd like to share because uh, most of what creation evolution comes down to, at least for me and and I grew up in the pastor's home and had a lot of questions, but ultimately it boiled down to genetics for me. And uh, there, there are some other things. We'll talk about fossils a little bit as well, but if you have any questions, just ask them at the end. So David uh, Gelertner, he says, uh, beauty is important in any theory, a scientific theory. Uh, beauty is often a telltale sign of truth and beauty is a guide to intellectual universe. It walks beside us through the uncharted wilderness, pointing us in the right direction and keeping us on track most of the time. And uh, he likes to think of Darwinian evolution as a brilliant and beautiful theory, but it's just been overtaken by science um, lately. And so he explains that uh, Darwin's main, pro main problem is that he didn't understand molecular biology. He couldn't, he didn't even really know anything about a cell. And so since that time, you know, we've learned a lot about biology and about genetics. And he says, Darwin would easily have understood that minor mutations are common, but can't create significantly, significant evolutionary changes or major, and major mutations are rare and fatal, uh, almost always. So, but don't fossils prove evolution? So we'll talk about that just a little bit. There's this uh, popular sequence uh, for whale evolution and whales started with like a kind of a, land rat-like creature and it grew over time and lived close to the water and eventually it grew fins and started swimming in the water and developed into a whale uh, from between like 40 million years to like 65 million years ago. So you just kind of start with the mouse and uh, then you end up with a walking bat sort of deal. I mean that that would be the equivalent. And uh, actually, uh, genetic speak, genetically speaking, a hippopotamus is more closely related to a whale than anything else, but it didn't evolve into the whale. And uh, so also what's interesting is the equations of population genetics, they predict that two specifically coordinated mutations to achieve fixation in any kind of reasonable population would take about 43 million years uh, with a population of 100,000 individuals. That's just two mutations and uh, with a generation time of, of five years. So how in the world, uh, in that same period of time, you're telling you you can go from kind of a, a walking dog or a rat-like creature to a whale in 43 million years when only two mutations could possibly be statistically fixed in that period of time. Also, uh, what's interesting is a paper that came out in 2018 by Stokel and Thaler. Uh, they said almost all animal species on Earth today emerged at the same time as humans. And it was a shocking conclusion. This is based on mitochondrial DNA. They said it happens 100,000 years ago that every species on earth today, almost everyone, uh, appeared at exactly the same time. So it's starting to sound rather biblical. So this all, also this 100,000 years that gets to reduce to about three to 6,000 years ago, if you base it on actually known human pedigrees for mitochondrial mutation rates for humans and other organisms because the mutation rates that they used were based on assumed evolutionary relationships between humans and chimps. But based on real-time mutation rates, uh, based on known human and animal pedigrees, the actual emergence of, or the uh, existence of all species, they came into existence at the same time, three to 6,000 years ago. So that's starting to sound very biblical. And there's this concept of evolution that isn't, or what I like to call evolution that isn't, that Darwin talked about a lot. Like, how do you get a bunch of birds and dogs and cats all from the same species, or same kind of animal? Like, all modern dogs arose from the wolf. How do you get to, that to happen? And all these finches that Darwin talked about, they came from the same single pair of finches originally. Well, what Darwin didn't understand, even though he lived at the same time, was Mendelian genetics. Gregor Mendel showed that starting with just two uh, parents, you can get a whole bunch of different phenotypes for offspring by just 
picking and choosing different uh, uh, options within the original parental gene pool. And then you can cross over the genes uh, during meiosis and you can get a bunch of different breeds of dogs. Within 300 years, all modern breeds of dogs, starting with the wolf, were developed pretty much within the last 300 years. So a lot of people try to call me a, like a hyper evolutionist, like extremely rapid evolution. But if you're starting with everything that you need, all the basic building blocks that you need to make all the different breeds, all present within the original wolf dog kind, it's very easy to rapidly produce all kinds of different breeds. So starting with the wolf, same thing with the uh, uh, horses, donkeys, and mules. They're all the same parental origin. The information for all these different creatures was there in the parental gene pool. And all you have to do is mix and match the genes and you'll produce like a mule. The, the reason a mule is sterile is not because the genetic information is different or lacking for the mule. It's just because the chromosomes are inverted. There's a loop because the chromosome is inverted relative, a section of the chromosome is inverted. And so when it matches up during meiosis, it fragments and it makes the, the mule sterile because when it fragments, it can't get all its genetic information to its offspring. But that doesn't mean that genetic information isn't there. It just means the chromosome fragments physically during meiosis. Also, there's this concept of hybrid vitality. Usually when you get two different uh, uh, animals that are more widely uh, separated in the gene pool and you mix them together, like a lion and a tiger, makes a liger that's bigger and stronger and lives longer. Same thing for a pizzly bear. It's a grizzly bear and a polar bear. Makes a pizzly bear. It's stronger, bigger, and lives longer. And a horse and a zebra makes a zorse. There's another liger. They're just amazing creatures. This is a uh, um, zebra and a horse, a zorse. Here's a zonkey, a zebra and a donkey. And then you have the uh, peacock pheasant, uh, peacock and a pheasant mix. And this is called a chickpea, a chicken, a peacock. And uh, it kind of looks a little bit bedraggled. And it, some of these do not live as long. Some of them don't survive very well, but still the, it's evidence that they came from the same gene pool, the same original parental gene pool. This is a pretty bedraggled creature called a chirk, a chicken and a turkey. This is a, a geep, a sheep and a goat. You don't want to be this creature at the end of time when God separates the sheep from the goats. So it also has a different chromosome number because uh, uh, the chromosome for sheep is 54 chromosome and for goats it's 60 chromosome. So geeps have 57, kind of in between. The little baby geep. So here's a camel and a llama. These creatures, a camel can be produced between a camel and a llama even though the camel and the llamas don't live on the same continent. So that means originally when they came off, the original parent, parent for the camels and the llamas came off of Noah's Ark, that that parent uh, got isolated in different continents. And then when the continents split apart, they developed into different uh, gene pools. But they still came from the original parent they didn't evolve from uh, something that didn't have the same information for both of them, even though the continents are now split apart. They can still intermix to produce viable offspring. Puma pard, a panther and a puma. It's a different intergenus hybrids. This isn't just different species. This is intergenus hybrids that are still viable. And so where's the limit? Well, there are no intraordinal animal hybrids. So you can get family genus and species hybrids, but you can't get between animals anyway, uh, different orders to uh, breed and produce viable offspring. There are some rare intrafamilial hybrids between uh, some guinea fowl like birds and stuff. And sometimes you just go too far, you know, you can't, you can't get the jackal and, and you can't get like a, a, a cat peacock either. So. <laughs> Uh, so, but the Darwin tree of life basically says that you can, given enough time and given enough mutations and selective pressure, you can get just about anything you want, starting with bacteria and go all the way to, you know, humans and, and apes and us and everything else. 
So which is the true story of life? This is the biblical story of life where you start with a parental kind that has a lot of creative potential in the beginning. And then it can separate into branches and produce a lot of different species uh, that can then interbreed with each other. And some of them can't even interbreed, but they still started within the same original gene pool, but it doesn't have infinite potential. It can only, it can only branch out so far and then it stops. A cat will always be a cat. A dog will always be a dog. It doesn't matter if it's a Chihuahua or a Great Dane, it's still a dog. And that's the biblical perspective on speciation. So which story is true? So I like to call different kinds of evolution that are real. This is real evolution, but I call it devolution. I call it type one, where you start, which one came first, the top fish or the bottom fish? Fish with an eye or fish without an eye? Well, it's always the more complex fish or the more complex creature that came first. The fish with the eye came first. And then after living in a cave for a while mm -hmm. where, where eyes don't give any advantage and the eyes go away, because if you don't use it, you lose it. So it's easy to lose something. That's another thing to gain something. So malaria, sickle cell anemia, there's a single mutation in the uh, genetic code for hemoglobin and you get a sickle cell anemia, which in the hemoglobin molecule, it doesn't carry oxygen as well. So the malaria parasite can't live in that person as well. So it gives you resistance to malaria, but it's really because of a, of a loss of function in the hemoglobin molecule that that uh, resistance to malaria is gained. So that's easy to lose something, especially if there's a benefit to be gained for the organism. These are flightless camerants on the Galapagos Islands. Again, if you don't use your feathers and your wings, they're, they're trapped there, they can't fly anymore. But the original parent could fly, the original uh, cormorant that came there could fly. And then after it lived there for a while and didn't go anywhere and didn't fly anywhere, Eventually, it lost the ability to fly. So again, if you don't use it, you lose it. This is the original cormor cormorant. Same thing with the uh, toxin injector. There's bacteria like the bubonic plague that can inject toxins into your cells. So which came first, the toxin injector or something more complex? Well, originally, the toxin injector came from the fully formed bacteria flagellum, the last bacteria to swim around in water and stuff. And the bacterial flagellum has 40 different structural parts. The toxin injector has, this, has 10 of the 40 parts that are very similar to the flagellum, but it lost 30 of the 40 parts. And now it only functions as a toxin injector. But originally it actually was derived from the flagellum. This is the complexity of the uh, bacterial flagellum, the actual motility system, all the 40 parts working together to help the bacteria swim. It's like an outboard motor, and it spins at about a, between 50,000 and 100,000 rotations per minute and can uh, stop and turn backward within a quarter turn. And uh, it's water-cooled, hydrogen-powered. It's a very complex system. So the, the arguments that you can start with a toxin injector and then evolve one of these things, well, those are just theories. They never actually are demonstrated in the lab. And statistically, the odds of these of even one of the steps happening are extremely unlikely this side of a practical eternity of time, like trillions and trillions and trillions of years. So it's like uh, losing cars, uh, tires on a car. Now it's just a giant paperweight or maybe a big, big radio. But uh, how can you go from this to getting a fully functional car? There's also other interesting, fairly recent finds like June 2019 where it turns out that more than half of fossil crocodiles were actually vegetarian, which tends to start to sound kind of biblical, like the lion eating straw like an ox and all those things in Isaiah that everybody thinks is crazy. But if you look in the fossil record, it seems like a lot of animals started out vegetarian and then devolved from there because vegetarian diets are more complex. Uh, it, it's simpler to be a meat eater because you don't have to have as many enzymes your intestines don't have to be as complicated. And so it's easier to go downhill to a meat eating and diet and it's harder to turn around and become a vegetarian. And so it's interesting that in the fossil record, more than half of crocodiles, I don't know what they ate, like giant watermelons or something. But anyway, they were mostly vegetarian or at least half of them were in the fossil record. And that's after 2000 years of pre-flood world. Also, there's some spiders even that live today that are vegetarian that only eat like pollen grains. They still make their webs and stuff, but they're entirely vegetarian even today. So 
people say, well, how in the world could a world function like that if everything is vegetarian? It's like, well, you know, a lot of things were vegetarian before the flood, it seems like. So it makes the Bible sound, sound like it makes more sense, like in Isaiah 11, when, it, again, talking about the lion and the lamb being friends and eating, both eating grass or straw. So there's also an evolution that's result of a loss of function in, uh, as far as antibiotic resistance is concerned. Most forms of antibiotic resistance are based on pre-established uh, interaction between targets and enzymes. And all that it takes is one little mutation and then the antibiotic doesn't bind as well to its target site and the uh, bacteria becomes resistant to that antibiotic. And that can happen very rapidly uh, within just a, a few months or so, it can happen uh, within a single person that they gain a population of antibiotic resistant bacteria if they don't use the, bac the antibiotic properly. So the reason for this is that it's very easy to break something that's pre-existent, that already has pre-existent function, but it's a very much harder to start with uh, something that's already broken and then make it highly functional uh, uh, at its original level of complexity. So the reason for this is based on something called sequence space. Sequence space is where you take into all, all various permutations of a certain length of, let's say, uh, a code, like a three-letter word. How many different three-letter words are there? And yet that's all permutations of two or three-letter words, that's sequence space for that length of a word. And so for three-letter words, uh, then you have to take the ratio of words that are defined versus words that are meaningless or sequences that are meaningless. And it creates stepping stones within the vast ocean of sequence space. And the ocean gets exponentially more and more vast as you increase the length of your, of your sequence. And so the ratio starts to becoming exponentially lower and lower as you go farther and farther away from zero, from your shore, from your shoreline. So evolving longer and longer words that make sense becomes exponentially more and more difficult and requires exponentially greater and greater amounts of time. For example, two letter sequence, the ratio of meaningful versus meaningless in the Scrabble dictionary is one in seven. The ratio for three is one in 18. And then a seven letter sequence, the ratio just kind of drops off a cliff. It goes to one in 250,000. And so you, you go up to a few hundred sequences, like for a paragraph or just a simple sentence. And all of a sudden it starts taking trillions and trillions of years to make it to another meaningful sequence by swimming around with a random walk within the ocean of meaningless sequence space. So random mutation natural selection just doesn't work beyond very low levels of functional complexity. And that's what first convinced me that evolution had a fundamental problem that could not be resolved by any sort of Darwinian mechanism or random mutation natural selection. Then there's another mut problem called the detrimental mutation rate. All complex creatures, every generation, have a detrimental mutation rate that's much higher than natural selection can remove. So not only are we not improving over time, we're getting worse over time. For example, every human uh, suffers about 100 mutations per generation. So. I gave about 100 mutations to my children. My wife gives about 100 mutations uh, to, her, to our boys, our two boys, that, they, that we didn't have from our parents. So every generation suffers another 100 mutations that the parents didn't have. And of those mutations, originally it was thought that three of them were detrimental and none were beneficial, almost none were beneficial. And so now it's more like 30 or 40 of them are detrimental, mildly detrimental to one degree or another, but certainly not beneficial. So we're, we're gradually headed downhill and there's no way for natural selection to remove this. Or for, let's say there's just three detrimental mutations per generation. A mother would have to give birth to 20 offspring in order to, for uh, 18 of them to die, for two of them not to have a detrimental mutation. And so the kids are heading downhill. So there's no way we could be around here for even 100,000 years or much less a million years because we'd all be extinct by now. And that's true for every animal that's more complex than a worm uh, because the, the uh, detrimental mutation rate is so high for humans and apes and birds and lizards and everything else that we're all headed downhill. We're all headed for eventual extinction. So we had to start somewhere much higher, much higher level of perfection than we are now. We're, 
we are much more mutated than Adam and Eve were, much more detrimental in our gene pool. And no one can explain how natural selection could get around this. All, all various options to overcome this problem eventually all head downhill. There's just no way to solve this problem. It's a fundamental problem for Darwinian evolution. There's a few of God's favorite numbers. I'll just kind of go through these very quickly. One's called the Fibonacci series. That they're looking for even in space programs like aliens uh, putting together a Fibonacci series. Fibonacci series is just adding the two numbers together to make the next number. Like one plus one is two, one plus two is three, two plus three is five. And it turns into a golden ratio. You can graph this thing out. 1.61 is the ratio as, after you go far enough out. And you can make spirals and you can make rectangles out of this. And it's used in uh, geometry because it's a very attractive ratio. It's a form of beauty. In fact, it's involved in nature all over the place. Uh, there's eggs and pine cones and leaves and, and cross sections of worms and everything has this golden ratio. And uh, flowers, uh, the petals on flowers, seashells, even galaxies have this ratio. And uh, this is Fibonacci uh, se sequence in broccoli. This is Romanescu broccoli. And uh, it's really cool. And it's also fractal in nature. The human body also has it all over the place. There's Fibonacci series throughout the human body. This ratio is the golden ratio between the top half and the bottom half of your body. Your hand is also the Fibonacci series. The way the bones that are structured, the ear, the way the ear is formed is also the golden ratio. Your facial structure from the side and from the front is also based on the Fibonacci series. Your arm to your hand, uh, it's all there. And so that's like, if this is what they're looking for from radio signals from aliens, why doesn't anybody get it? Like this, this ratio is everywhere in nature. So why is it not designed? So this uh, James Tour, he's a chemist, a synthetic biochemist one of the top 10 chemists consistently in the world for the last 15 years or so. He says, let me tell you what goes on in the back of the rooms of science with National Academy members and Nobel Prize winners. I've sat with them and when I get them alone, not in public, uh, because it's a scary thing if you say what I just said. Do you understand all this, where all this came from and how all of this happens? And so he, he makes the little cars and things out of, out of atoms. He, he synthesizes these things and then they have races on little on little cubes of gold. Anyway, so he knows what he's talking about because he synthesizes all these things. He knows how difficult it is. He says, every time I've sat with the people who are synthetic chemists who understand this, they go, oh, oh no, we don't understand how all this stuff just goes together. I've sat with National Academy members with Nobel Prize winners. Sometimes I say, do you understand all this? And if they're afraid to say yes, they say nothing. They just stare at me because they sincerely can't do it. So, um, I'll just skip through. So what's the opposite story from somebody on the other side? This is Lawrence Krauss. He wrote a book called Something for, or a Universe from Nothing. The goal of evolutionary biology and evolutionary atheists in general is to explain how everything, the universe, living things, unliving things, everything came from nothing. So how in the world can you believe that? So uh, Richard Dawkins, he thinks this is the greatest book ever since uh, Darwin wrote Origins of the Species. And he says that basically kicks God out of the out of the universe itself. Darwin kicked God out of out of living thing, the origin of living things, and Lawrence Krauss have, has kicked God out of the origin of the universe. And so, I'll just skip the video because basically he said uh, the universe comes from nothing because everything adds up to zero. All the spins, everything adds up to zero. And he's basically right, except for one little key point. And so, what's the key point? The key point is entropy. The, the information in the universe had to start with very, very high level, very high precision information on the order of one over one followed by 10 with 123 zeros after it. That's extreme precision. That's like picking the same grain of sand out of the Sahara Desert 10 times in a row with your eyes blindfolded by random chance. It's like, how do you know exactly all the details of the universe. It's the information that's complex in the universe and no one can explain where this information came from. So in other words, maybe there was a big bang, but the big bang wasn't like random. It wasn't like a tornado. It was extremely precise bang, like uh, like these drones flying around at the, uh, 
Olympics when they when it looks like a fireworks, but it's just drones flying out making pictures in the sky. That's kind of like how the origin of the universe was. It's kind of like a tornado doing something like this. I'll show you a little video clip. So extreme precision, right? And so, but some people say, well, just don't call it God. They get very upset because they just don't want God in the picture. But why is that? Why are they so dead set against God? Uh, Lawrence Krauss again, he says, maybe there is an eternally existing multiverse that we can't observe or test scientifically. Maybe it has laws that we don't know about, which would allow our universe to pop into a being. Maybe this popping into being was uncaused. Who made God? Who made God? Religious people are so stupid because they just assume brute facts. Religious people are against the progress of science. They don't want to figure out how things work. But naturalists like me let the facts determine our beliefs. Philosophers are stupid. They know nothing. So then it was on a radio program. And so the radio host asked him a very interesting question about his claim for a multi-universe where basically infinite numbers of universes are out there. And ours just happened to turn out statistically right. It just happened to have that last tile fall into place because odds are, since there's infinite numbers of universes, that one of them would happen to turn out just right. So Briarly asked him, Lawrence Krauss, hey, do you see any evidence for purpose in the universe? And Krauss said, well, maybe I would believe if the stars lined up and it happened to spell out a message from God, maybe then I would believe. And Briarly said, no, you wouldn't. That wouldn't be evidence for God, given your multi-universe view, because stars are going to line up somewhere in some universe if there's enough of them out there, right? So if there's an infinite number of universes existing for an infinite amount of time, then anything can happen no matter how unlikely it is. Therefore, no evidence could convince you that God exists, since the unobservable, untestable, eternal multiverse can make anything it wants. It's like its own God, except it doesn't judge you, right? And so how he's going to answer this question, because everything becomes statistically likely. Two-headed cows, ten-headed cows... Arnold Schwarzenegger winning the California lottery 10 times in a row. Everything becomes possible and equally likely given enough universes. And so how is Lawrence going to answer this? So Lawrence basically said, that's a true statement, which is shocking me. Sometimes they become honest. So he said, that's a true statement and very convenient for atheists who don't want to be accountable to God, don't you think? You talk about this God of love and everything else, but somehow if you don't believe in him, you don't get any of the benefits. So you have to believe. Then if you don't want to do it, then if you do anything wrong, you're going to be judged for it. I don't want to be judged by God. And that's the bottom line. So it's not about science. It's not about evidence. It's about judgment. He doesn't want to be judged. And that's the bottom line. So it's the same thing for us Christians. I don't want to be judged either. I mean, I've done a lot of bad things. We're all in the same boat. And uh, the difference between the Christian and Lawrence Krauss and atheists in general is that God has taken judgment for us. He's uh, taken judgment upon himself, Jesus on the cross. And so that when judgment comes up, say, look, we just point to Jesus. And he says, Jesus took my judgment for me. And so I don't, I am no longer judged for who I was. I'm judged for who Jesus was. And so this is the big difference. And so if you turn your eyes on Christ, then you don't have to worry about this. And then you can actually do science and follow the evidence where it leads. Whereas these guys, they're so scared about judgment that they can't even do science or think rationally about statistical analysis. They come up with all, up with all kinds of strange multi-universe ideas, everything they can think of, however irrational it may be, in order to avoid the thought of judgment. That's the bottom line. So thanks, guys. Well, thank you for joining us today. We hope you found today's presentation to be a blessing to you. And you know, it's never good to keep things to yourself. It's always best to share them. So find someone that you can share what you have been blessed with, with others. If you enjoyed today's presentation, let us know by hitting the like button and subscribe to this channel if you want to know when there's new presentations coming out. God bless. Have a great week. We'll see you next week.